morning. My name is Pastor Nick, and I'm so excited to be up here to share God's Word with you all this morning. Um, so we've had a full week now of, you know, springing the clocks forward. So everyone's awake, right? We're good to go. Everyone's had their wake-me-up juice. We're ready. Okay, y'all, don't sound so enthused. It's like 1130. We should be... We're good to go, right? Because I got to ask, I want to start this with an important question for you all. So I need everyone functioning at full capacity right now, okay? So this is important. So... The question to start off today's message. What are you afraid of? Go ahead and and share with your neighbors. If you're online with us, please go ahead and put it in the chat. What what are you afraid of? What do we think? Hmm? Rats? Okay, that's fair. Spiders. You got any? (laughs) Okay, I like that. (laughs) Okay, y'all, again, I thought it'd be a little louder. Again, it's it's later, you know, let's let's have a fun conversation about this. Uh, I heard snakes. Um, I I like snakes, but that's because in the Midwest we didn't have venomous snakes, and I moved down here to Texas, and I learned that that's a different story down here, right? Um, Or maybe clowns. Clowns is usually... A big one. Uh, Last service, I mentioned uh, in-laws. No? Well, that's good, right? I I love my in-laws, too, right? Um, So as I was looking up and researching these ideas of fears, I I wanted to find some some funny ones to share with you all this morning. So I just got a couple that I found online, and the first one is this xanthophobia, which is the fear of the color yellow. Or there's uh, cathosphobia, which is the fear of sitting down. I'm sorry. Um... Then there's, there's a, f- a fear called uh, pelodophobia, which is the fear of baldness or bald people. You know, don't point, okay? Um, and then this is, this is a fun one, too. There's, this is actually a fear. I looked it up. It's uh, homolophobia, the fear of a sermon going way too long. Right? But we don't have to worry about that here, so we're good. Um, as I was looking up fears, I then started to look at what do different states you know, what is the most popular fears in, in different states? And so, as somebody who was born and raised in Ohio, I went to Ohio first. And Ohio's greatest fear is Michigan football, right? That's funny because they lost this year to Michigan. But also, a little shameless plug, my Ohio alma mater, Xavier University, is still in March Madness. They're actually playing right now, so go X. Um, then I moved to Chicago for seminary, and so I looked up what Illinois' fear was. And theirs was uh, public speaking which actually is kind of funny because that's where I first learned how to speak publicly. Um, and now that I'm here in Texas, Texas' greatest fear is rain, right? A couple drops and everyone on the highway starts going 15 miles an hour. It's ridiculous. No, actually, Texas' greatest fear for some reason is holes. I, I, I don't know why. Maybe somebody who's been here all their life can share that with me later, but Texas' greatest fear is holes. Um, as I was looking at these in, in the country, a common fear that actually came up is this fear called uh, autophobia, which is the fear of being alone. And uh, just like in a side note right here, what an awesome opportunity for us as the church. Seriously, what a great opportunity. Like people are longing to know and be known, to find meaningful connection in a community. And, and I really hope, I really hope for all those who gather with us online or in person that that you know that this is a place where you can belong before you believe. That especially for those online, you know, whether you're you're worshiping with us as you're heading into work, you're you're worshiping with us at home or or in the replay or or maybe you're on a nice beach somewhere. I've I've done that before. That's pretty fun to worship on the beach, but wherever you are, I hope I hope you feel that belonging, that connection because you can belong before you ever have to believe. And if you're, if you're not sure about this whole Jesus thing, that's, that's all right, okay? That, that's all right, because when you can find true, meaningful connection and relationship, when you're able to live into that, that understanding of relationships that matter, then that Jesus stuff, that'll all fall into place. My point is for this morning is that we all have fears, big or small, some we can share with others, or, or some that maybe we have never shared with anyone our entire life life. My guess is, though, a fear that I didn't hear, but, but one that I, I bet might be up on our list is, 
is sharing our faith with others. That might be on that list. When it, when it comes to proclaiming the gospel, when it comes to opening ourselves up to who Jesus is in our lives for others, my guess is that that might be one of those fears for you. Um, I see that especially uh, when I tell people I was going to seminary or that I'm a pastor. Sometimes people kind of uh, tense up about it as if they have to share their faith in a very specific way because I'm a, I'm a pastor. But, but really, loving God is, is loving God. It doesn't matter how you articulate it as long as you articulate it. So we're currently in this series called First Things First, where we're looking at the priorities of Jesus. And during this season of Lent, these, these 40 days excluding Sundays leading up to Easter, we can evaluate in our lives maybe where we have, we have missed those priorities that Jesus raises up in the Gospels, and, and we can turn back to the one who is always faithful. These last three weeks, Pastor Russ and I have hit on the big three, love God, love people, love yourself. And these are, these are major priorities that Jesus lifts up for us. But today I'm going to shift, I'm going to pivot, and we're going to talk about another one of Jesus' priorities. When we look at the gospel and when we, when we read about the life of Jesus, we are introduced to a Middle Eastern Jewish rabbi. He would step onto the stage of history some 2,000 years ago, preaching his good news message in a Roman-occupied Israel, and as a message that would change the course of history forever. Jesus, first and foremost, was a teacher, and everything that he did pointed back to the Father to share that good news to a broken humanity. The priority that I want to look at today is, is sharing our faith with others, how we can be teachers just like Jesus showed us. Now, before we go any further, I'm sure there's somewhere out there that says, whoa, 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 pastor, that's your job. Teaching and preaching is your lane. And I would say, yes, a part of my calling as a pastor is teaching and preaching God's word. You're, you're not wrong. There's also the calling to be a teacher, that, that profession of teaching. But, and this, my friends, is a big but, we all are meant to share our faith, to preach. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean to preach the same way that Pastor Rusty or I do on Sunday mornings. But this church has demonstrated on many occasions that you don't have to be ordained to be up here and preach. But it does require a level of, of training and skill. This word preach, as it is in the Bible, comes from this Greek word which means to proclaim, to declare, to announce, or to herald a message. We all, as Jesus followers, are called to do that, to declare and announce the good news of Jesus in the world. But, but don't just take my word for it. Jesus tells us this in the Gospels, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and in Matthew 28, verse 18 and 20. And we'll look at the reading from Mark here first. So in Mark, it says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And then here in Matthew, this is part of the, the Great Commission. In Matthew, it goes like this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What I really appreciate from this text specifically is that last sentence there. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I appreciate that very much because I, I wonder and I, I got to believe that on some level when Jesus was talking to his disciples, they were afraid too. They were afraid to go out into the world and to proclaim that good news on some level, maybe out of a fear of execution or fear of being imprisoned. We don't have that, that same difficulty today, but, but there is a fear around it. And what I love is that Jesus is telling all of us, just as he told those first disciples, wherever you go, I will be right there with you. I actually, I also heard a, a funny story this past week from, from some mission partners who serve in Faith Kids, and they were lifting up some of the older kids are starting to ask trickier questions. Did you all know that? As kids get older, they like to ask trickier questions. And it was great. They said they might not have had the right answer or that, but they didn't just shoo them away. They talked about it, and they lifted it up. And, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Right now, I'd encourage you all, if you would uh, open your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 14 
and 15. And it says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So during this season of Lent in particular, at the, usually at the beginning, I will be asked by folks, you know, what book should I read in the Bible? Or what scripture passages are important during the season of Lent? And my, my first response will always be, just do it. Just open your Bibles. Just read it daily. Just dig into God's word. It, it doesn't matter where you start. Just read it. Now, I, I will say something fun you can do during the season of Lent, and maybe your definition of fun is different from my definition of fun, but um, you can read the book of Romans, or the, or the epistle, the letters of, to the Romans. It'd be a great read during the season of Lent, and, and I encourage you to do it with a friend, because uh, it's kind of a little daunting, but in a good way. And the reason I lift that up is because Paul's letter to the Romans is meant to be instructional in nature. It's intended to provide direction. And during the season of Lent, that's what we're doing. We're being redirected back to Jesus. We're we're reorienting. We're seeing where we've we've missed the mark and we're we're turning back. So the book of Romans is is a fun book to read during this season of Lent. So what we have here in this reading is essentially four rhetorical questions. And they each begin with the word how. And each question is connected. And Paul begins at the end and works backwards. The first question is this. How can they call on the one they do not believe in? This is actually connected to the verse before in verse 13 that says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Paul here is actually quoting from the prophet Joel in chapter 2, verse 32. This means that there has to come a point where we actually name it. We call out to the Lord and confess our faith in Jesus who saves us. Salvation requires more than just going to church once in a while. I actually uh, recently heard a pastor kind of put it like this. They said, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than you standing in your garage makes you a car. Okay, and FYI, all we are pro-church here. Okay, please keep coming to church, right? Make it a priority in your life. We are glad you are here with us. Make it a priority so that we can then go out and be the church in the world. Calling out to God means something more than just showing up to a service. It means expressing our need to God for salvation, that we on our own can, cannot save ourselves. It means repenting, turning back. It means putting our trust in him and following him. Faith, as Martin Luther put it, is a living, bold trust in God's grace, so certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting in it. Such confidence and knowledge of God's grace makes you happy, joyful, and bold in your relationship to God and all creatures. The second question that Paul lifts up here is, is how can they believe? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? So, you know, very plainly put, someone who knows Jesus tells someone who doesn't know him, and they share the message with them. And not only is that that true for today, but it was especially true in the first century, when very few people could read, and most of the stories were passed down by word of mouth. It's not like today where you can go to any hotel room and open up your nightstand, and boom, there's a Bible, right? Most people would have to hear the message of salvation, and Luther, during the Reformation, lifts up this understanding that the church is meant to be a mouth house. Funny, funny way of putting it, right? A mouth house, And essentially, it's this understanding that we are to then proclaim the gospel in both word and action. That that is our job as the church. And we talked about this in our Bible study this past uh, week. And if you didn't know we're doing a Bible study, we are. You're more than welcome to join us. It's on Tuesday nights at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. It happens over in the discipleship corner, but you can join us on YouTube Live as well. So we are talking about the gospel. And so, I think sometimes we, we unintentionally make the gospel all about us, without realizing it, and that it's so much bigger than us. 
Some people have settled for a version of the gospel that, that says, you're a sinner in need of a savior. Jesus died for you, so if you believe in him, you will go to heaven when you die. And, and don't get me wrong, that is, that is a part of the gospel, but it's, it's not all of the gospel. Because yes, the gospel does include our sins being forgiven through the sacrificial death of Jesus. But the gospel is so much bigger than that. The gospel isn't just about individual salvation. The gospel is an invitation into partnership with God for the renewal of creation. The gospel is that announcement that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, our God has once again become king. God's kingdom comes with a king. And, and thankfully, it's not you and it's not me. And that is really good news. And he is the king. Not the future king. Not the king of, of some kind of future afterlife. But he is king. And by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we proclaim every week. We say, Lord, would your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven? And my friends, all of us are invited into that good news. And I know that that was kind of a lot. That was a very uh, complex way of talking about the gospel, but a very simple way, just a one-sentence way of talking about the gospel that I like the most is saying the gospel is good news about how God has reached us. What we are talking about on any given Sunday are not like good steps or ideas of how I can reach God, but instead the good news of the gospel is that when we could not do anything to climb the ladder, God comes after us. God initiates. God sent God's Son to earth for us. We love because he first loved us. The third question that Paul raises is, how can they hear? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? Now again, preaching can come in many different forms, and for me, in my calling as a pastor to preach and teach God's word on Sunday mornings as a gathered people— is a very sacred thing for me, and, and I do not take that lightly at all. In fact, as I was going through the candidacy process in order to become a pastor, essentially there's a, a group of people in your candidacy committee. They're kind of like the gatekeepers. They decide on whether or not you can go on to be ordained. And uh, during one of the years, they, they asked me in a conversation, they said, well, what do you think of the sacraments? Because I'm ordained to word and sacrament. And I, I said, they're cool, right? Like, they're great. They're wonderful the way in which God is physically present with us. Like, what a wonderful thing. And I guess at the time, what I didn't do well enough for them was articulated in this way. It's not me. I am the steward of the sacraments. But they are gifts from God. They are gifts from Jesus. Just when, like when we came to the table. It was a gift that Jesus gave to all of us a very long time ago. And as a pastor, it is, it is my honor and privilege to preside at that table. But it's not me. It's a gift that he has given to all of us. And the same goes for my understanding of, of preaching the word and declaring God's word. It's, it's not about me. It is a privilege to be up here and to preach on Sunday mornings. And our goal, anyone who gets up here and preaches, we hope that what it, you will hear is not from us, but from Jesus. That we are to point to someone who is so much greater than ourselves. I think this verse also underscores that God chooses to work through imperfect humans, just like me and you. And I, and I know this to be true because on some Sundays, when I'll come off the platform, I'll just feel like, man, I missed it. I could have done it like this, and I think it would have been better. And I just kind of get a little hard on myself about it. But, but one Sunday in particular, I remember going out into the gathering place after, after worship, and, and a mother came over to me, and she started to cry, and she said, I needed to hear that. And I, I knew for certain that, that that wasn't me. That was Jesus talking to her. That was the Spirit talking to her. That wasn't me. That it is so much greater, that it comes from someone so much greater than me. And when we talk about preaching and teaching on Sunday mornings, it's, it's a privilege and it's an honor to be up here. Now, unfortunately, y'all, I think, I think we get in our heads, though, about what a preacher is. Is. And I think we do this for other professions as well. So, like, if we're, we're talking about doctors, what's that image that comes to your mind? Is it like this, if you grew up in the 2000s watching uh, Grey's Anatomy? 
Or maybe if you think of lawyers, what do you think of when you think of lawyers? Maybe suits? There's always mahogany, though, right? When you think of lawyers, there's like dark mahogany somewhere, and they're always in suits. The problem is when you picture a preacher, you probably think of someone like Father McKay, right? From MASH. I think, unfortunately, when we get our picture in our head about what a preacher or a teacher of God's Word is, we don't think of, of you. We don't think of you. And part of what Paul is getting at, that if, if you are a Christian, if you are a Christ follower, you are to preach good news. You are to proclaim that good news of the gospel. And, and here's the thing, you know, God could have chosen any number of ways to get this news out, right? Like, God could have sent angels singing in the heavens 24-7 to do this, or God could have sent and made the clouds into words like airplanes do sometimes, you know, right? But God didn't do that. God didn't do that. God chose you, and God chose us. That we are invited into bringing about God's kingdom right here on earth. And it starts with us sharing that good news. We all are to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Unfortunately, anymore, I feel like preaching can get a bad rap at times because it can become synonymous with, like, judgmentalism. Like this idea that, that you're wrong and I'm right. And that's not what biblical preaching is at all. Preaching is about sharing good news, plain and simple. An example of it would look, be something like this. Like, like, hey, do you feel like you're, you're coming unraveled at the seams? Do you feel like the bottom has just dropped out from under you? Do you struggle to believe that you can ever be known or ever be loved or ever be forgiven? Are you caught up in this rat race of always trying to be good enough and always trying to be successful enough and holy enough, and whatever else enough it might be. Well, listen here. There is good news. That's what we are to share. So today I've titled my message, Show and Tell, because I believe that if you want to share the gospel well, all you have to do is show and tell. Now, I began this morning by talking about our fears, but I believe one of our favorite things in school to do was show and tell. Am I right? If, if you're online, go ahead and share with us what were some of those favorite things that you like to show and tell. For me, and I'm excited to get to do it this morning, I love to show and tell my Pokemon cards in school, right? So as a child in middle school in the 2000s, um, we loved collecting Pokemon cards, you know, had to, had to catch them all, right? And uh, for me, at my school, it became so popular that they banned Pokemon cards from the school. But there was an exception, show and tell. And so me and my friends, when we'd bring our cards for show and tell, we would take up the full time limit of our time for show and tell. Like our teachers would have to stop us. Okay, Nick, go back to your seat. The next child needs to come up. But man, I would go to my teachers and talk about Pokemon cards. I would go to the older students and talk to them about it. I would go to the nuns. Yes, I went to a Catholic school. I'd go to the nuns and talk to them, the janitor. I'd talk to anybody who would listen about Pokemon cards. And I was excited about it, right? How awesome would it be if we could do that with sharing our faith, if we would be excited and passionate enough to go up to even strangers and share our faith, how great would that be? Jesus showed us how to do it, and and we see an example at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. And this section of the Gospel is called, Jesus Announces the Good News. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming what? The good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, I want to be honest with y'all. This is something that we all can work on. Even me. Even me. Um, Recently, Morgan and I got to go on a a wonderful vacation, and we were going to be on a plane for like seven hours. And for me, I always, it's my luck that I get stuck next to that, like, chatty Kathy. And, like, I don't really want to talk on planes, but I know I'm just going to get stuck next to that person. And one of those questions that always comes up in small talk is, well, what do you do? And so Morgan and I had to plan, what would I tell them without lying to them? And so we had to think about it. And ultimately I said, well, I'm a public speaker, right? I share good news with people. Every week I get to share good news with hundreds of thousands of people in person and online. And I'm not kidding, y'all. I got on that plane, and sure enough, somebody started talking to me. Ultimately, I 
had to tell them I was a preacher because they started asking way too many questions about it and I didn't have my backstory lined up good enough. But we all can work on this. Like I said earlier, there were uh, some mission partners who had shared with me uh, about this Faith Kids encounter where an older child was asking <laughs> them questions about the story. And what I loved about their answer was they didn't like shy away from it. They had a conversation. They were able to talk with them. And, they, and you know, you're able to be honest about it. You don't have to have all the right answers, right? I, don't, I certainly don't have all the right answers. If you do, you should come talk to me. That'd be great. But it's about showing up. It's about just being there. There are many ways in which you can show and tell the gospel. And it doesn't have to be in a Bible study or a theology course or getting up here on Sunday morning and preaching. There are so many other ways. Show people how Jesus has changed your life by the way you live each and every day. And you can tell people how Jesus has changed your life by sharing your story. It's yours. You know it best. It really is all about relationships that matter. I don't think I have to tell you that, that our world is hurting, that people are in desperate need of hope, of a hope that cuts through all of the noise, all of the chaos, all of the heartache. I believe sometimes it's a, it's a simple smile. It's a prayer. It's a text. It's a, a written note. It's a call that can make all of the difference. And, and I know this to be true because I've experienced that in my own life. I've been on the receiving end of that, of a, of a hug from a friend when, when things seem difficult. It can make all the difference, and that's what we are, we are called to do, to share that good news. And, and look, y'all, this isn't a sermon about being nice to people. I mean, you should be nice to people, okay? Please be nice to people. But Scripture calls Christ followers to be set-apart people, peculiar people, even bizarre people. And I know some of us are further along in that category than others, right? We are to be set apart. And how we live our lives is to emulate how Jesus lived his life. And trust me when I say, people during the time of Jesus thought he was living a pretty bizarre life. Lastly, Paul lifts up and asks, how can they preach unless they are sent? I'm going to let you all in on a little secret this morning. Here's the secret. We all are commissioned. If you are in Christ, you are a sent person. Jesus says this in John, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This isn't meant to just be like some, some holy huddle on Sunday mornings that we do and then we don't leave. We are to go out into the world to be the church, to share that good news to those who are hurting, to those who need it most. It's great to be in here. It's great that we share our faith like this on Sunday mornings in worship, but we are called to go out into the world to share that with others, to share that with our friends, our family, and even the stranger. Usually in worship, whether it be the first service, we have a very traditional way of ascending. We say, go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Or we do it in here as we end with a praise song, right? If you are in Christ, we are to be proclaiming good news with our lives. As scary as it might be at times to share the gospel, fear can rob us of an adventure that God calls us to live out. Fear is a liar. Perhaps Paul would have put it like this. How can they be disciples if they have not believed? And how can they believe if we don't open our mouths? If we don't say something? If we don't do something? I appreciate how Paul ends this reading. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. God's word, it is active, and it is alive, and we are meant to share it and go forth and proclaim it with everything that we are. People cannot look to Jesus if they do not believe in him, and they cannot believe in him unless they have heard about him, and they cannot hear about him unless somebody tells them. So the most important question for today, why not us? For me, I find one of the best examples of what it means to share the gospel in our reading this morning from Mark chapter 5. Jesus has just healed this man from, from demon possession, and Jesus says this very beautiful phrase to him. He says, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And I think that's it for us too. Go home. Wherever 
that is, or whatever that might look like, whatever sphere or bubble that is, go there. And listen, you don't have to have all the right answers. Your T's don't have to be crossed and your I's don't have to be dotted. Just go and share what Jesus has done in your life, what Jesus has done for you. And you don't have to sanitize your story. We are a messy people. And when we are able to be honest and open and vulnerable about that, my friends, that is exactly where Jesus enters our lives each and every day, right in the messiness. That even though we are broken, God loves us. That even though we make mistakes, Christ saves us and keeps coming back to us when we have turned away. God's plan has always been for ordinary people to share the extraordinary story of Jesus. So let us go forth to share and to show and tell the amazing news of Christ. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks as you, you gather us this morning for this holy huddle, as we feel nourished, and as we feel able to go out into the world, because you send us there to share the amazing news for a hurting world. And at times, dear God, I know it might be hard, but you have invited us into this, that you have called us to be a part of this beautiful story of your creation, of bringing your kingdom right here on earth. And when we feel afraid, dear God, I would, I would ask that you'd help us to remind us that you are always with us, you are always for us, and you will never forsake us or leave us. That you are with us as we share our stories, as we share about how you have impacted our lives and changed our lives for the better, that you have given us purpose and meaning, and that we are able to go out into the brokenness of this world to share that with others, to mend that brokenness, to mend that hurt and that pain and that suffering. And all we have to do, God, is go and share your story. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.